salted egg flavour potato chips. It should work, but it doesn't. Um, you might be thinking, oh, it must be nice, a kind of savoury, salty flavour. But in fact, it tastes like somebody dropped a bag of sugar over some potatoes, and the end result is disappointment. This was supposed to be my reward for a job well done today on my 1980s Japanese living room, which I've spent all afternoon working on. It's a reward that now feels somewhat redundant. Nevertheless, check out the actual working retro television in the corner over there. Admittedly, when I did plug it in earlier, I did think, I hope it doesn't show real Japanese television because nobody deserves to watch that. Now you might be thinking to yourself, well, uh, ah! Now, right about now, you might be thinking, wait a minute, did you just say bad things about Japanese television? Japanese TV's amazing, and I hate anyone who says otherwise. What about Dakeshi's Castle, the game show where people fall over in the mud for our amusement? Or what about the show where the guy eats a door handle? An actual door handle, and he eats it. It's probably the best thing I've ever seen. A hilarious act that probably wouldn't go down very well anymore. But what if one of the greatest myths about Japan to the outside world is that Japanese TV is actually good? because while people falling over in the mud or eating door handles is undeniably great entertainment, I can't deny that. Unfortunately, the reality is quite the opposite. Now over the years, by virtue of having lived here and done this, I've found myself on both sides of the screen, uh, both as a bemused viewer and as a bemused participant. Are you a YouTuber? I am. <laughs> And I've somehow ended up on TV around half a dozen times, including Japan's biggest morning breakfast show, Mezumashi Tenebi, thanks to the horrific behaviour of YouTube supervillain Logan Paul, which we'll get onto in a minute. I've always wanted to make a video talking about those somewhat awkward experiences and breaking down the aforementioned myth, but I didn't find the real motivation to do that up until a few weeks ago when a TV show here aired a segment that beautifully personified everything wrong with Japanese TV in about 10 seconds. Shrewd TV pundits on one of Japan's biggest channels were discussing why and how the number of cases of COVID-19 was so low in Japan, and a groundbreaking theory was put forward suggesting it's something to do with the Japanese language itself. Was it because the Japanese language is more elegant and softly spoken? A test subject stood before a tissue and said the phrase Kore wa pen desu, literally, this is a pen, to measure the exhalation of air and any potential virus-riddled spit as she spoke. Upon speaking the phrase in Japanese, the tissue barely moved. A testament to the refined and superior nature of the language. Next, though, came English, and that's when things got really scary. This is a pen. A pen. A pen. The sheer destructive force of saying this is a pen in English blasted the tissue away. A a testament to the crude, abrasive nature of the English language. Cue the reaction from the enthralled commentator stuffed inside a tiny box. The writing was on the wall for the English language and for the letter P. And I think we can all agree, looking at the results of this objective and meticulous scientific experiment, the results are abundantly clear. Was there a lack of cases in Japan due to the wide adoption of face masks or an absence of mass testing? No, it could only be Korewa Pendes, this is a pen. I know for a fact because I've done the experiment myself, so I know it's true. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled bollocks. To be honest, I'm as guilty as anyone else of believing that Japanese TV was on another level before I came here. Uh, like a lot of people, I grew up watching reruns of Takeshi's Castle. A game show in which around 100 willing participants battled their way through increasingly sinister obstacles in order to take the castle and beat Takeshi himself. It was ludicrously hard. In 133 episodes, only eight contestants ever actually took the castle and won the grand prize of a million yen. A grand prize that wasn't really so grand when you converted it into dollars and pounds, especially given the questionable scenarios the contestants had put themselves through. The winnings probably wouldn't cover the cost of the health insurance claims. Nevertheless, I've given many reasons over the years as to why I moved to Japan. Cultural exchange, learning a language, becoming an English teacher but it was all a lie. The real reason was, just wanted to be on Takeshi's castle. So you can probably imagine my horror and despair. When I started working as an English teacher, my students asked me one day, Chris Sensei, what's your favorite Japanese TV show? And I thought, yes, this is my chance to show off, to show that I've actually watched a Japanese TV show. So I sort of said, well, I like to watch Takeshi's castle, yeah, Takeshi's castle, yeah. 
Uh, no, I was met with a deafening silence because none of my 16-year-old students had seen it, apart from my 50-year-old colleague who fondly remembered it and gave a nostalgic grin. Because it turns out Takeshi's Castle finished broadcasting in 1989, one year before I was even born. <laughs> The truth is that outlandish, wacky game shows that most people know about uh, are very few and far between, spectacularly rare and difficult to find. People often ask me, oh, you must watch that show, Candy or Not Candy, the one where people walk into a room and start eating random objects to see if it's candy or not. You must have seen the guy stuff a shoe into his mouth, or the lady munch on a delicious, tasty table. And of course I have, it's ingenious, it's glorious. And it's also a half hour segment from a TV show broadcast six years ago. It's not an ongoing series, although it definitely should be. It's just a funny thing that happened once in 2014, and it's been repeated so much that people think this is what Japanese TV looks like. So far we've heard what Japanese TV isn't, we've heard the expectations, but what is the reality? What is it actually like and why do I avoid going on it? Imagine if you were to switch your TV on right now, outside of Japan, what would you expect to find? Drama, tension, suspense, I'm right, you're not. Views, debates, conflict, it's what we crave in the West. We want to be angry, we want to be uncomfortable. Fucking donkey. It's not Gordon Ramsay's fun kitchen, it's Gordon Ramsay's kitchen nightmare. It's not that everyone's a winner factor, it's called the X Factor and you haven't got it, ha ha ha. Terrible. But then again, he doesn't exactly have it either. We want cretins, we want sycophants, we want monsters. We love it and we watch it over and over and over. Now imagine you wake up tomorrow morning, switch on the TV, and everyone is exceptionally happy. There's no criticism, there's no negativity, just everyone is happy and positive in an almost uncomfortably utopian manner. Imagine an episode of Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares where he walks into a restaurant, is sat before a dish, and instead of saying the usual phrases like It looks like a dog's been sick. Where's the mint sauce? Imagine if instead he just said Wow, that's delicious. Oh, amazing. Wow, it's so good. It's delicious. Wow. As a one-off, it might be acceptable. But imagine if he then did that not once or twice, but every single time, in every single episode. Wow, it's delicious. Amazing. No other constructive criticism, no other comments, just blind, superficially positive statements repeated over and over and over as if someone was threatening him secretly off screen to act that way. And that is what Japanese TV is like. And for once, I am not exaggerating. It has a very fake, dumbed down feel to it where Presenters are forced to display a disturbingly theatrical enthusiasm towards the most utterly mundane things. <laughs> now yesterday I did something unspeakable. I sat down and actually watched some Japanese television. And I did my own meticulous scientific experiment, just like Koriwa Pendes, where I went through some programs to see if there were any key traits or attributes that they all had. And I boiled it down to four points. And the four points are, number one, every show requires hyperbolic language, where everything is sugoi, meaning incredible, or oishi, meaning delicious, or in some cases, umai, which means really delicious. Number two, you need lots of canned sound effects. Every action on screen must be accompanied by some sort of comical cartoon sound effect. The sound you hear the most though is hey, which kind of means like what? The sound is so ubiquitous that it's actually put in post-production. They'll have a studio sound of all the audience going hey. Stage three is the entire screen needs to be drenched from top to bottom in text, and finally, of course, is stage four, the infamous reaction box where an enthusiastic presenter is forced to look on and deliver a relentless positive appraisal of everything happening on screen. And to give you a quick example of all those things combined, let's now do a horrifying simulation of what the Aurora Japan channel would look like if it were on Japanese television. こんにちは、皆さん。あの、ブロディンジャパンへようこそ。今日はですね。この
すごい<笑>本当にびっくり超うめえ超うめえこのポテトチップスうーん今までこんなうまいポテトチップス食べたことないすごいさすがカルビさすがカルビあーうまいぞこれすごい Yeah, again, they taste dreadful. It should be illegal. It should be a crime to brand something as salted when it actually tastes sweet. I can't be doing with that. But congratulations, guys. You've just watched every Japanese TV show about food ever. Well done. Now you know the kind of performance and sheer excitement required to go on Japanese TV. You can probably realize why I don't enjoy doing it very much, which takes us through to my own awkward. Experiences. The first time I featured on Japanese TV was during the Brexit vote in 2016 when a local TV station wanted to interview a British person and get an expert, expert opinion on what was happening basically and interview twice, once on the day of the vote and once on the day of the results. The TV crew came over and after discovering that I was a YouTuber, for some reason they wanted me to hold a camera in the frame, just randomly in the apartment, because that's, you know, that's what YouTubers do, isn't it? Apparently. And they also wanted me to pull a face while I was doing it. The end result was I ended up looking like a fucking murderer. I was then asked if I thought Brexit would actually happen,、uh, to which I said, no, of course it won't. Never. In a thousand years. The bonds are too strong economically between the UK and the European Union. And economic benefits aside, there was also the bond of mutual respect, a bond that was quite simply unbreakable. Anyway, the next day we left the EU and the TV crew came round again. Now, I was a bit disappointed by the results and、uh, surprised above all,、uh, but the TV crew really wanted me to exaggerate my reaction as if the world itself was coming to an end. I was asked to glare at the laptop screen, clasping my mouth in shock, biting my fingers in despair as I nursed a mournful expression. And naturally, because I'm a YouTuber, I was forced to do it all with a camera stuck next to me on the desk all the while.、Uh, you know, just like I always do. I, d- I don't know how I've got so far into a video without not having a camera in shot. What's going on? Anyway, despite the experience of looking like a murderer on Japanese TV, though, one year later, when one of the country's biggest TV channels reached out to me and asked me to feature on a show eating the local cuisine of North Japan, I of course said yes and jumped at the chance and the prospect of fame and glory beyond my wildest dreams. Best of all, it was all filmed in English, so I thought I could be myself a bit more. This also meant the entire show had a chillingly robotic English voiceover. Japan. A land of four seasons and bountiful nature. Oh, fuck yeah, bountiful nature, bring it on. Now, I thought we'd be eating something good, like pork or fish or a cheeky bowl of ramen, which the region is famous for. Instead, however, it turned out I'd be eating nothing but vegetables. Clearly, they hired the wrong guy for the job, as I was quickly handed an assortment of pickles and told to give a big happy face and reaction as I ate them, which I then inevitably failed to do. Very nice. In a desperate attempt to elicit some kind of performance, though, they secretly, sneakily drenched some of the pickles in this extremely spicy mustard. And then, rather than pretending to enjoy the experience, I had to actively hide the fact that I was in pain. Oh my god. <laughs> It's quite spicy. It's p o s h i k a r a n a In reality, I wanted to say, holy fuck, it tastes like someone's put a flamethrower in my mouth. But instead, I had to sit there and go, oh, it's, it's delicious, it's amazing, bountiful nature. Yeah, boy, who am I? Who am I? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Absolute bloody torture. But the worst scene was on a farm where I had to eat some edamame soybeans in front of the kind elderly farmer who'd so painstakingly cultivated them, only for me to turn up and fail to show them the appreciation they so sorely deserved. Now, odds are, if you've been to a Japanese restaurant, you'll have had edamame soybeans at some point, and they are very nice. They're a great start or a great side dish, you can't beat it. But the variety of edamame that I was trying on screen were actually called dadachamame, which are, well, just edamame with a different name. There's no literal difference. However, for 40 minutes we stood in the field as I had to painstakingly describe the difference between edamame and a dachamame, even though there was no difference whatsoever. I had to make it up and I could not do it. Over and over, about 15 times, the producers tried to put words in my mouth and try and get me to see the difference that wasn't there. Like, to give you some example, imagine you took a crisp, right? You split it in half, I ask you to eat this one, and then I ask you to eat this one, and then compare the difference on camera for 40 minutes in a field on a hot summer's day. And I just couldn't do it. And throughout the whole ludicrous situation, the nice, kind elderly woman just stood there bemused, wondering what the hell was going on. 
In the end, they just gave up and turned the entire 40 minute ordeal into a 10 second sequence and just quietly and awkwardly faded me out while I was still speaking. Mm. The difference here is it's kind of juicier. The secret of these delicious beans is in the seeds. Sorry. Six months after my disastrous performance reviewing soybeans and pickles, I found myself on Japan's biggest morning show, Mezamashi Terebi, after the universally beloved YouTuber Logan Paul came to Japan for a few days and left a trail of destruction that included filming a corpse of a recently deceased individual and throwing Pokemon balls at Japanese police officers. Uh, you know, like you do. As both a YouTuber and a foreigner living in Japan, I was summoned to deliver a scathing verdict and seemingly defend every foreign YouTuber in the world ever. The TV crew came to my apartment, sat on the floor, and I repeated the phrase, I am shocked and angry, about four times before they went back on the train to Tokyo. But I was, yeah, I was pretty angry, but really angry. And of course, because I'm a YouTuber, I had to set up my camera in the background again, because that's what YouTubers do. But despite the serious subject nature, it all had a bit of a wacky vibe to it when the presenter knocked on my front door and insisted on doing this. Are you a YouTuber? I am. <laughs> Chris Broad. To this day, it remains the greatest thing anyone's ever said to me when I've opened my front door. So at this point, you might be wondering, why is Japanese TV this way? And ironically, the reason TV's so bad is also the same reason living in Japan is so good. It's no secret that Japan is one of the most polite cultures on earth, where people are very reserved and appreciative for things and food and people around them. What you're seeing on screen is essentially a reflection of everyday life in Japan that's been grossly exaggerated. And as much as I would love for Gordon Ramsay to do a season of Kitchen Nightmares in Japan, it's simply an equation that just doesn't work. If Gordon Ramsay walked into a restaurant here and went, oh, it's disgusting, it's like a donkey's been sick. It just wouldn't go down well. It would be incredibly rude, the chef would be mortified and humiliated, there'd probably be some sort of unpleasant altercation, but viewers would just feel deeply uncomfortable as opposed to feeling entertained. You might be thinking at this point, oh, you just don't get it because you're foreign, right? And that might be fair enough. To come from Western television to Japanese television is a jarring transition. However, a recent study showed even 18 to 29 year olds in Japan are losing interest in TV. 12% don't watch TV at all anymore in favour of streaming platforms and video games. And that is a trend that's been increasing over the years. And while I'll continue to avoid watching it, except for as a background noise on long lonely nights in hotel rooms, even I have to admit, Japan just wouldn't be Japan without it. It is so otherworldly in its presentation. And you've got to see it at least once or twice if you come here. Like put it on, check it out. It's a cultural experience unto itself. This is a pen. So what do you reckon? Am I exaggerating? Is Japanese TV really as bad as I've made out? Let me know in the comments below. But that's it for now though. For more behind the scenes content, check out the Abroad Japan Patreon. But as always guys, many thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. And now it's time to tune into my new favourite TV show. It's just starting. Konnichiwa minazan, Abroad in Japan, yonkazo. Kyo wa desu. Kono potato chips, tabetai to omimasu.